So it's the morning after the, the, the first candidates debate in the Conservative leadership. Uh, it would be fair to say, I think it escalated quickly. Um, Pierre Poiliev appeared to get under your skin, but on the plus side, I think, for people watching or for your supporters, you got passionate in response. Um, but why would you put yourself through all of this at your state of life? <laughs> it's all, there's people like yourself that say, why is he doing this? <laughs> well, because of what I believe in. You know, you, uh, it's been the story of my life. And, and people who are involved in politics, if they're involved for the right reason, are there because they, uh, they believe in a number of things and your life is significant. And that's what I believe in. It's been the story. I mean, from the, the moment I ran in 84 to uh, running for the leadership for in 93 and the day after. I mean, this isn't just about, you know, the day after the 93 campaign, which was a train wreck. There's two of us left. I'm 35 years old. I could have chosen to do something else. And maybe had I known what I was getting myself into, maybe I would have done. You know, that's the kind of decision you make at a certain point in your life where you don't know everything you're getting, and, and so be it. I have so, no regrets, but I did it. I, I, I didn't back down from that challenge back then, and I never backed down from any challenge. Well, yeah. let me ask you about that. So, so people my age remember, you know, you spent four years rebuilding yeah. the Conservative, Progressive Conservative Party, yeah. as it was. You were then a standard bearer in the, in the 95 referendum, yeah. then moved to Quebec and fought Bouchard essentially to a standstill because he didn't hold the, the third referendum, which he may well have done if, he'd, if he'd, he did. That, that was the plan. That's what he says. But for many of today's Conservatives, though, that's all, these are all war stories. Yeah. It's, it's ancient history. Yeah. Um, there doesn't seem to be any recognition, far less gratitude. Well, that. Does that upset you? No. And I'm not looking for gratitude uh, at all. I did what I did because I, I believed in it. And, uh, but it is relevant for one reason. We can't take our country for granted. And anyone who thinks they, we can is making a grave mistake, and that's what I see now. Anyone who thinks that you know the humor or the sentiment of Western Canadians is just a, a passing thing that will go away is making a huge mistake. But the, the battles then were, were generally about national unity. It, it seems to me the divisions today are quite different. Um, they seem to be between the, the elites, of which I guess you and I are deemed to be representative, and the people with no control, which are, appear to be represented by people like Pierre Poilier. Do you, do you recognize that framing, or think it's true? I, I, I think our challenge is to uh, speak to what it is that is, a, you know, the things that unite us and a higher calling. It, it isn't to cultivate those differences. That's the difference. If you're in politics, you have a choice. You can speak to the lowest common denominator, cultivate the dark side of people's, uh, because we are human beings. And, uh, and that's, that is a choice you make very early on in your, your political career. Or, alternatively, which is what I believe in, you try to reach for higher ground and, and put out uh, a view and a vision and, and speak to our better angels. We have a choice. But, and that's always the case, by the way. It is always the case. And, and that's what I, I believe in. And by the way, yes, the, you know, I'm not about the past, but the past speaks, it, it, is, it says something about your character and about who you are and what you believe in. Well, on that point, I mean, uh, Pierre Poilievre again raised the issue of, the, of your uh, fiscal record in Quebec, that you raised taxes uh, and left the deficit. <laughs> Can you tell, me, tell us in a nutshell about your government's fiscal record in Quebec? It's one of the best uh, performances in the country, if you look uh, at the real record. Deficit's a good example. I'll give you one example. We did a fund in 2006 called the Generational Fund, the Fonds de Génération, to reduce the size of the debt. And what we did was take revenue from uh, non-renewable resources to put it in the fund to reduce debt. The credit rating agencies gave us, gave us a very high score on that, and we were able to reduce the size of the debt relative to GDP. And to this day, that fund is still there, and it's still viewed as one of the foundations of Quebec's 
policy to get its fiscal house in order. What I was faced with when I came in relative to what I left in the end was a world of difference. And you know what the story is, John? It's about fiscal discipline. I had learned, by the way, but what Mr. Chrétien had done in the 90s and Bouchard. Chrétien cut federal transfers to the provinces 40 percent, the cash transfers in a single swoop, 40 percent, and created a lot of damage when he did that. Then Lucien Bouchard, end of 90s, to balance the budget, retires, pays, pays 5,000 nurses to retire, pays 1,300 doctors to retire, to stop working. You think back today that you say, that, that, that was... Now, they didn't, both of them didn't do that because they wanted to hurt anyone, but they thought that was the best approach. When I'm elected in 2003, I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. We took an approach where program spending was below nominal growth, and we maintained it in discipline, and we didn't have to break everything along the way to get there. And you know what? When we left office, we left one of the best economies in the country jobs, the fiscal situation, a higher credit rating in Quebec than Ontario? Than Ontario? Really? Well, there's a reason for that. It's called discipline, determination, and that's, that's what I, I did. And that's called good management. So those, I'm very proud of that. The overall fiscal picture when I left is that Qu Quebecers are paying less. And, and the deficit, I mean, you heard them. We, excuse me. speak to the a, a historical view of many people that this record, and the, the ignorance of the facts, that this record well, is now being tarnished is, is conservative. I'll just give you one exact ignorance of the facts. We just conveniently forget that in that period of time we had the biggest recession since the Great Depression of 1929. The federal government also went in to deficit spending. We all did, and for the right reasons, but Quebec had the best performance of Ontario, Canada, the United States, and Europe. And why? Because I reduced personal income taxes. And on average for middle class families and lower income families, that was $2,000 a year. And don't take my word for it. I mean, the Japan Credit Rating Agency, if I remember correctly, who gives us our credit rating, pointed that out as being one of the reasons why Quebec's economy performed better than the rest of Canada, because I reduced personal income taxes. And you know what? The Harper government, of which Mr. Poitier was part of, opposed that. They, they thought that was a bad idea because they, I used the money from what they had, what was called back then, the fiscal. I remember it well, and it, it, um, it went down very well in Quebec. It went down very poorly in the rest of Canada, which... Why? Why? Because I think the money was, was uh, deemed to be uh, uh, aimed at expanding services in Quebec, not in cutting income tax. I just don't get it. I really don't get it. I really, really but conserv you conservative. You appreciate that some of the antipathy toward you comes from people John, who were around at the time. John, who let, didn't me, appreciate. let me point out, nine provinces out of ten that year reduced income tax. Nine out of ten. But we, we were I don't have the facts to have, but I do remember. I, well, that, I do. That, I, I do remember that uh, there was huge surprise in federal circles that you'd actually done that. But well, we, we'll get bogged down in this two, all day, though. Why, a, 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 a conservative government who thinks reducing income taxes is a bad idea. A. B. We live in a federal system. Since when does the federal government dictate to a province who, I mean, I just, for, for us, we just shrugged and said, what? What? And by the way, we should send uh, Laurence the exchange that uh, we had in the newspapers between uh, Michael Fozzi. You remember Michael Fozzi? He wrote a paper on that. and. Uh, at Apoquette and I responded, I, I want to send you that and you'll get, you'll have more time to read what the story is. Okay, moving on. Yes. Because we could, we, we could uh, all our yesterdays will get bogged down. When you decided not to run in 2020, you, you talked about a deep change in the Conservative Party. Yeah. Presumably those changes still exist. So why run now? Because I see a country that is even more uh, divided now than it's ever been and I think Mr. Trudeau's leadership uh, hasn't been uh, good for the country. Economically, we're at sea. You know, Mr. Trudeau's uh, government has been all about spending. And during COVID, we get it. I mean, yeah, we get it. We all agree that we had to spend to be able to support the economy and avoid the worst. Do you think it was inflationary, by the way? It con contributes to inflation. Sure it does, as it does all over the world. But you know, and this whole story on inflation, 
has been around uh, for the last, and, and there was this great debate of whether it was transitory or it would be permanent, and I think the central banks made the round call. They did, but uh, all of them. The European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, so did the uh, Bank of England, so did the uh, Fed. They all did. And, uh, and I, you know, I gave an interview before going into the race to BNN, and I was asked whether they should increase rates on the 26th of January. I thought the bank at that point should have moved right away. And I'm not contesting the bank. I'm not in that. You're not suggesting you would no. reign in its independence? No, no, no. I'm not uh, this, this idea of, uh, which is uh, honestly bizarre. But, uh, but you know, uh, we, it is inflationary. And I always thought it would be inflationary. Of course, how could it be otherwise when you're pouring all this money into the economy? How, how long can you defy the laws of gravity is the real question. I put it in simple terms. Same thing for the amount of debt, you know. And then uh, this modern monetary theory was trotted out, uh, which uh, is all, you know, funny money based on the assumption that money grows on trees. And I'm not saying that's what the Bank of Canada did, but there were those who all of a sudden rediscovered this uh, economic theory about... Uh, now, uh, we're at a point where we have to deal with inflation and we have to control spending. And, uh, and I think we also have to look at the tax, a burden of uh, maybe a good way to deal with it if we want to allow Canadians to be able to catch up on their, their ability to uh, increase wages, which is, that's the issue here. When you say tax, you, that you would reduce taxes? I would. We should look at reducing income taxes, yeah. And then if we want, if we're faced to, the real, the short-term danger for us is going to be stagflation. That's going to be the, and we've, we've seen that movie before. So low economic growth and high inflation. That's, that's the thing we need to avoid. So we're going to need policies to promote economic growth. We need more growth in our economy. And yeah. that's, where, that's where the Trudeau government is weak, very weak. There is. It's all about spending, mm. and uh, and it's not about economic growth. And whatever they've done certainly hasn't worked. You mentioned bizarre um, theories on, on the Bank of Canada. Another theory that is somewhat bizarre, seems to me, is Davos Man, and this whole uh, World Economic uh, Forum conspiracy. And yet, correct me if I'm wrong, but you uh, kick-started the Canada. EU trade agreement at Davos when you met Peter, Peter Mandelson, who was the, the then EU trade commissioner. Is that right? I'm impressed you would remember. You read Mandelson's book? I did. And that's where it happened. And uh, the story behind that is, uh, is, uh, is interesting because it was Jeremy Kinsman, who was our ambassador in the EU, who came to me uh, the first, I knew Jeremy, saying there were, we're negotiating this investment uh, agreement which is similar to what we've done with other countries. And it's not going anywhere because there's no one who is, uh, there's no one carrying the ball. And I mentioned it yesterday in the debate, no big projects happen unless there's someone who grabs onto it in a leadership position and makes it happen. Nothing. And so he, he, uh, he knew me well enough and did, did stop by and when I was premier and say, you know, you should look at this, frankly, you could if you choose, chose to. And then Roy McLaren was the chair of the Canada European Business Council, and he uh, also uh, wanted me. And then I organized a meeting of business leaders, went to Davos, and asked to meet with Mandelson. And that's where uh, I put the proposal to him. Mandelson's reaction was very interesting because we'd just come off the Doha round that went off the rails. and. Uh, the European Commission at the time was looking at options of doing deals with emerging economies, which was all the flavor of the day, the BRICS at the time. And the question he asked me is, why? Why would I do it with Canada? Well, what's my interest? I mean, our economy is relatively small. <clears throat> and there's two arguments that I put to him, John. One was, you have, we have an opportunity to do something new that will be trend-setting and to set up a new model. We, we have that ability because we are, we share some common values. But the most important reason why you'd want to do this is because one day you may want to look at doing a deal with the United States. And if you do that, it would be strategically intelligent for you to deal a deal with Canada first and set the model. And I reminded him that you remember that there's an unwritten deal with the United States when you do a trade agreement. 
they reserve themselves the right to interpret the rules. You will want allies around the table. And in fact, they did end up opening up negotiations with the United States, TTIP, which almost, almost killed our negotiations because the opponents to the American deal in Europe, because that lit a fire, understood that if you wanted to kill the deal with the Americans, the best way to get there was to kill the deal with Canada. That was the easiest route. So anyway, <clears throat> we did a very, it's the most forward-looking trade agreement in the world. It's had a very positive impact on Canada, but not as much as it should have because our business uh, leaders and small and medium-sized businesses have not taken advantage of it. That's a real issue for Canada, by the way. We do all these trade agreements, but then we don't really activate them. And, and that's going to be a challenge. So I'm getting the five-minute warning here, and, and I've got three questions I would like to squeeze in if we could... Uh, be brief in the answers. Now, one of the, you're talking about leadership, and one of the things that you mentioned in your uh, platform was that it's no time for amateurs in politics, and uh, presumably you're referring to your leadership rivals. Uh, do you see the standard of uh, candidate is not high enough to, to deal with the problems that we're facing? I'm no, no I'm not. Uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for my rivals. Uh, Leslie Lewis and Scott Akison and Roman Barber and uh, Baber and and and, uh, and Brown and Patrick Brown, who I've known a long time, and then Mr. Pudiev, whose hand you didn't shake, I noticed. Well, it didn't happen. He didn't shake my hand. Is what you're saying? Mm. Is that it? So uh, you know. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for them, and I don't underestimate them. Uh, I never underestimate my adversaries in politics in this race, and in the end, we're, we have to all work together. And just, uh, you know, related, well, you have is four times the support in caucus that you've got. You know, for somebody who wants to unite the party, is that a problem if you win? If you know anything about the histories of leadership races, you'll know that uh, caucus support is not and far from it a determining factor in whether who wins or not. It's the memberships who will decide, the A and B, John. You know, it's human nature. I'm not in the caucus and he is, which is fine. I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not offended by that. The day after though, it'll be very important to work with caucus and I've done that and I've done that in all circumstances and I have a good track record of working with caucus. I, I believe in that relationship. Just finally, so you um, working with Huawei while the two Michaels were being detained in China was, I think many people would agree, not a good look. Um, you said in the debate that you were proud of working for the release of the two men and that if anybody who wanted evidence should speak to Michael's, Michael Kovrig's ex-wife, yeah. Fina Najibullah, Correct. which I did, and she said she was very grateful for your efforts and your support. Can you tell us what you actually did? Well, we, uh, we talked uh, several times during that whole period of time to try to sort out the situation so that the two Michaels could return, because it became quite obvious that if we were able to sort out that whole uh, case about the uh, uh, extradition that the Michaels would return. I mean, the Michaels was a state-sanctioned kidnapping. That's what it was. It wasn't, uh, you know, there's no other way of describing it. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, and as much as I can tell you, we worked very hard knowing full well that if we were able to sort that out, the two Michaels would return. And that's why I worked very closely with uh, Vina Najibula, who I came to admire a great deal. I think she was quite extraordinary. But your, your role was more on the extradition than on dealing with the well, diplomatic side, right? We, uh, we worked, uh, all of that became part of the same story at one point. But let me, <clears throat> let me just back up a bit. You know, Huawei was welcomed to Canada by the Harper government. And I'm not blaming them for that, I'm not faulting them for that. Because at the time, it made sense. But then the story changes as we move, as, as often is the case. Now, when I'm doing work for them, I'm not doing anything that's contrary to the interest of the country, and I'm not doing lobbying. And, and, uh, and then as we move into this leadership race and the events have happened, I am very committed to the policy of banning Huawei, and I will do that. 
and because that's the higher interest of the country. And so I'm very comfortable with what I did. And I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm proud that I was able to help in whatever way in helping release the two Michaels because we worked very sincerely to help make that happen. As a Canadian, we felt very strongly. When I say we, I'm talking of our team. We felt very strongly that if we could do anything to make that happen, that we would, and we strive to make it happen, and it did. Okay, well, I think we've, we've run out of time. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Good luck.